All the praise and thanks are due to Allah SWT. Salutation upon Nabi Muhammad SAW and upon all the Anbiya that Allah SWT sent for human kindness. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> We're on the doorsteps of Ramadan and it's just potentially just a few hours away. And although we know that this month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an, most of us are primarily focused on the fast. Food is a big issue for all of us. And I'll really speak more about the fasting and what the fast means and some guidelines on fasting. I think the first thing that I'd like to highlight is the commandment to fast. And that is in Surah Bakr, I'll actually hear it um, I think in the first Rawi, inshallah. But as Allah says, Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu, O you who believe, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu, kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakum. He translates as follows, O you believe, siyam, fasting, is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you, la'allakum tattakum. I think what's interesting here is Allah Subhanahu used the word kutiba from the word like kitab, right? And Allah says He has prescribed this for you. Uh, he's given you a prescription. When we think of a prescription, it's almost like a medical letter. You're sick and you have a prescription to sort out some problem of yours. <coughs> and this fasting is also a prescription for us as Muslims. But Allah Subhanahu prescribed it and it's there to fix something. At the end of the verse, Allah Subhanahu says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُمْ That you may gain taqwa. So essentially fasting, if you look at it, its purpose almost like a medical prescription, there to fix a problem. And the problem it's there to fix is taqwa. So I think we've heard many uh, talks about taqwa before. In brief, it really means to be Allah conscious, to be cognizant of Allah, to be aware of Allah, to subject oneself to Allah's commandments. So that is taqwa. So by fasting we sort of become obedient. But I think the other meaning of taqwa is from its root, from waqa, which means to be uh, cautious, to safeguard yourself from harm. It speaks to a sense of an alertness. And what's interesting is when we fast biologically, uh, after a few days our bodies release something called an endorphin. It's like a chemical that actually creates some degree of alertness in us. You'll notice, you know, when you start fasting the day two or day three, sometimes you smell better, you hear better, so things just seem to occur to you. Lallakum tatakun, that you may gain this um, greater awareness as well. So fasting is a very broad set of achievements. Obviously one is to gain closeness to Allah, to be much more conscious and to be much more alert as well. So it does serve a purpose and it's a prescription that Allah gives us. But with this prescription comes certain um, exceptions, and the next verse gives very clear indications of what those exceptions for fasting are. It says, "Ayyam ma'adudat." So the fasting is not for all time; it is "Ayyam ma'adudat" for fixed number of days, and we know that is the month of Ramadan. And Allah gives concession. He says, "But if any of you is <coughs> ill or on journey, <coughs> the prescribed number should be made out from days later." <coughs> So exemptions are given from fasting for those who are ill and that could be a variety of reasons. Even uh, a pregnant woman, for example, might be healthy but they might develop some sickness during their pregnancy. Elderly people might be fine but might develop some sickness. So you're exempted from fasting in those cases. Or they might be that you might be on a journey traveling and it's quite hard and difficult to travel and therefore you're exempted from fasting. <coughs> but the condition is that you make it up by days later. The verse is quite categorical on that. But Allah gives a further exemption. He says, for those who cannot do it with hardship, is a failure, is a ransom. And Allah says, it is a ransom, the feeding of one that is indigent, but he that will give more beyond free will, it is better for him. And it is better for you that you fast if you only knew. So the rules of fasting, the purpose is a prescription for us to gain taqwa, and the exemption of those who are ill, and those uh, who are traveling are exempted from fasting. So what's interesting is that Allah gives you an instruction to say you don't have to fast. So if you're ill and you insist on fasting against good advice, 
There's no righteousness in that. Because Allah has given you this exemption and therefore you should uh, not fast when it's uh, not suitable and make it up a days later. And for those that really cannot make it up, so you might find that it might be elderly people that you know when they reach the age where it's very difficult for them and they're unlikely to be able to fast later. They're allowed to give um, in charity to feed an indigent person. You might find, for example, a person with diabetes with insulin dependent. They've got to take daily injections and their diabetes is not very well controlled. And they will be lifelong on their medication. So in those cases, they're allowed to pay uh, a fidya as such to, to, uh, to overcome that uh, difficulty that they have. <coughs> that was the next question is, what does fasting actually do? And fasting is an interesting process. Um, it's been practiced for ages in different forms. But in the format that we fast today, we look at it's, it's, fasting is not a stage of starvation. It's a minor starvation. <coughs> But generally your body will, if we eat, our body takes all that glucose, etc. and stores it in our liver, in our muscles, etc. And when we don't eat for a while, your body starts using the glucose from the liver, uses the glucose from the muscles, etc. And once all of that's consumed, then the body turns to fat as the next set of stores. And starts consuming the fat. And finally when that's completed, then it starts eating away the muscle. And that's when you reach starvation. And starvation occurs over like weeks of no food and drink, etc. So with the fast that we observe, it's a, it's a minor <coughs> a form of a starvation that really eats away the glucose, but also eats away some of the fat. So you actually, if it's done correctly, it could actually lead, you, lead to weight reduction. But when you feast, then obviously you destroy all of that. But, uh, but fundamentally, fasting achieves that. If you just had your normal diet and you skipped a meal every day for the month, you would notice that your body starts eating away some of the fat. And that's what, what, what fasting does. And so it's a very useful opportunity this month to allow us to not only get our spirituality in order, but our health in order as well. I think Ramadan provides an opportunity where we're supposed to be more disciplined. And you know, when you think of Ramadan, and some of the information I'll share with you today, is actually from an interesting document uh, produced by the Department of Health in the UK. And I advise you all to go and search it on Google. You go, you search for the, the UK, you search UK and Department of Health, which is called the National Health Services, NHS, and Ramadan Guidelines. A very nice, beautiful booklet produced by the UK government. You know there's a lot of Bangladeshis, Pakistanis there, with a lot of health issues. And Ramadan, they overeat, they end up in the hospital, so they should produce a nice guideline to guide you as to how you're supposed to behave in that month. But if you just think of the benefits and what we achieve in Ramadan, <coughs> And I'm speaking to smokers out there. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I baffle you. You tell a person stop smoking, this, that. They just don't listen. But Ramadan, they can do it. You know, from sunrise to sunset, mm -hmm. hey, no cigarettes. You know. Okay, when they break fast, they go for it, right? But the reality is, you wonder that there is the innate ability of self-control. There is the ability to do it. And for me, that I think smoking is one example. And if you can cut it down in the day, can you reduce it at night? But I think also in terms of dietary. I mean, if you can withhold yourself from certain foods in the day, can you control yourself at night, you know? <coughs> because you, you've proven that you have some degree of self-control. And you look at, you know, it was interesting, the same UK document, I mean, the, the opening <coughs> introduction is about the stats on, on health issues in the Indian community. You know, they compare all different race groups. Smoking is higher among Indians in the UK than the rest of the population. Diabetes is higher. All the health issues are just higher, right? And I think, with us, with the month of Ramadan, provides us opportunity to stop smoking, change our diet slightly to improve on it. You know, and I think that's what we need to think through for this month. Uh, so the next issue <coughs> is, for this month of Ramadan, we fast, and we will abstain from food and drink for that period of time, and it does have health benefits, creates an alertness in us, creates us a sense of a responsibility to Allah and consciousness that we do it for Allah. And therefore, we're more aware of Allah. But in terms of the fasting and the seri and the iftar, what should we actually be eating in Ramadan? So I think the principle of uh, balanced diet still holds true, uh, and I'll talk about that just now. But I think what we need to appreciate is that this is a month of fasting, it's a month of missing lunch. Right? It doesn't mean you're going to make up for lunch at night. It just means that you're fasting and you agreed to skip a meal for Allah's sake and you will control yourself. I think that's the first thing is that we need to have a balanced diet, the normal diet that we have, but essentially just a little bit less for the month. 
Unfortunately, we want to cover up for the, the diet we missed for lunch. So I think that's the first thing. The second is in terms of what do we eat and what's useful to eat. <coughs> so bear in mind that your body goes through some degree of starvation. So at every time you need to ideally be eating foods that can last longer. So if you eat cake or cream, that sugar, it's just a sugar boost and the body destroys it in hours. And it doesn't last for the day. But if you eat oats, you eat rice, you eat bread, it takes the body longer to break down. So those kinds of things are useful to have a clear time. The other thing is in terms of fruits. Fruits have a lot of fiber and they take a long time to provide a lot of energy, but they break down slow so you have more energy for the day. So those are the kinds of advice for, for sharing. In terms of iftar, you need to really again have a balanced diet and really there's no restrictions on what you eat, but I think it needs to be in moderation, number one. And I think if you look at what the Prophet used to do, he used to eat dates, which is sort of fruit with fiber, uh, have lots of water, because often hydration becomes a problem in the day because you haven't drunk anything and you sweat. You, you breathe out um, water as well if you don't, you don't realize that as well. So having fr uh, fr uh, fruit like dates, water is important at iftar time. But you know, if you look at the Quran and the different types of foods that's described in the Quran or the Prophet used to eat, you find the Quran mentions certain fruits and vegetables, olives, onions, cucumber, figs, dates, grapes. We really eat fruits in Ramadan. You know, we don't really go for the pies and samosas, but I think try and bring a lot of fruits into the um, iftar time. And then the Quran talks of fish, it talks of the flesh of fowl, which is chicken. So I think also trying to move away from the red meat and trying to move towards chicken would be important. I think this is a month that we show discipline. If we can get it right in Ramadan, it makes it easier going forward. <coughs> so those are the things that I think are important from a fasting perspective. <coughs> and actually in terms of foods to avoid. So I mean, I could spend a whole hour of all the things that we should not be eating. But I think there's still certain things that we often uh, do wrong. And what's nice about this guideline that the UK has produced was um, it's really designed to address the Indian diet because we really have bad habits and could you sort of try and minimize some of those risks and they've sort of adapted it to so that you can go, they'll talk about rotis and they talk about a variety of other things but I, I won't go through that now but I think the few sensible things that they highlight and hope these ladies listening so you can ensure the home is well uh, cared for um, so the first thing is often we like to deep fry like the samosa and etc but you could shallow fry, so you have less oil in the pan, you know. It'll taste just as good, but a little bit less oil. Even when we make our curries as well, maybe the recipe requires four teaspoons of oil. You could use three, you know, fast from one teaspoon of oil for that month on a meal. So I think those are simple, practical uh, things that we could try and improve. And once you get the hang of it in Ramadan, you can continue on and sort of improve um, your, your dietary uh, behavior going forward. The next issue is around sugars. So often we like to eat sweet stuff, donuts, cakes, you know. Get, you know, in the day you go to, I don't know, to a baking take or rolling pin and you see the stuff and you have to buy it and then at night you need to eat it, you know. But I think it's again, could we try and all, find an alternative? So what they suggest is avoid sugar based and go for more milk based. So instead of having the baklava, go for a pudding, which is more milk driven and a little bit less sugar in it. So those kinds of dietary advice is quite useful. And then the last is obviously around tea, coffee, and Coca-Cola. And that's really a big problem, right? And what we don't realize is caffeine actually is a diuretic. So it actually causes you to urinate more, and you actually lose and you become more dehydrated. So try to avoid it and just stick to good old water, which is much more... You find when you break your fire, don't break it with Coca-Cola, drink water. And you find that your, your thirst will be quenched much better, and you'd actually be better hydrated for the month as such. The last, obviously, thing around eating and diet is the worry around overindulgence. It never reminds us in Surah 7, Allah when it says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِفُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah Surah reminds us, but waste not by excess, for Allah loves not the wasters. And sometimes you look at the diet that we eat after iftar, you can actually feed another person with that food, if we just ate our normal meal. And I think we should run the month of Ramadan, it's also a month to share with others. So rather eat less and give more. Give more outside the home. So I think <coughs> those are key elements around uh, fasting. There are several other issues around health in Ramadan. Uh, issues around whether you can take injections, whether you can take an asthma pump, a nasal pump, use patches, etc. 
And you can go online and I indicated and I highlighted again. There's a nice guideline from the UK Department of Health with mm -hmm. the Muslim scholars that have written on the document uh, advising on what's allowed, what's not. But principally, if it's not food, essentially it's fine. Uh, so like a nasal pump, some have disagreements, but fundamentally if it's not food, uh, it is principally fine. But obviously if you have, if you're on a drip, you're obviously not fit enough to, to fast. Uh, and that's the practical advice that's required. So just uh, to remind the people who have come in late, inshallah, the month of Ramadan is on the doorstep. Fasting is there really aimed at um, teaching us that way. It's a kutiba, it's a prescription. Like you go to a doctor, you get a prescription. There's a prescription Allah has given us to gain taqwa, and taqwa applies not just in terms of being, awareness, uh, being aware of Allah and following His commands, but also being a bit more alert in our behavior and actions, etc. But also in terms of how we eat and what we eat in our diet for the month of Ramadan. And I think sensible, balanced diets, a lot more carbs and less meat, less sugar uh, items, etc. And I think this is a perfect time, we're all in the mood, uh, you have a discipline, you have a routine, etc. And I think this is a month to actually Get the savvy right, don't over eat, eat your normal breakfast. You know, if that time eat your <coughs> normal supper, you know. And then obviously now and then have a samosa or empties, but shallow fry, do the more practical things in terms of minimizing it. Inshallah Ramadan will be much better. And lastly, lastly, just in terms of <coughs> the the one challenge that often Muslims have in the month of Ramadan is headaches. And those are really driven around our addiction to coke and tea, coffee, etc. So Really, that, that's one challenge, and that's the fast. But I think the second is hydration, which is important. Take a panaro to make the fast a bit better, and it's really bad for the first few days. So those are the practical things. But the last one is really about sleep pattern. So it's often a very difficult month because you're fasting, you come home, you eat, you go to mosque, etc. So try and sort of have a decent night's rest. Otherwise, you'll just harm the next day. So I think it's, uh, it's a very blessed month. There's a lot of goodness in it. And let's make the best of it so that inshallah the months after Ramadan become very valuable for us in the month inshallah. Shalak al and I wish all of you a happy Ramadan inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.